Welcome back to part two of the life story of Laura Catherine Ship Lewis. Make sure you check out part one of my story. So I'm going to back up just a tiny bit to 1983. In 1983, we were visiting some friends of ours from church, the Polsons, and we really liked their new house. And it was located in Damascus, a little bit south of where we lived, and it was in a subdivision. And the area that we had lived in on Larson Lane, it was all two to five acres, and the people lived there because they didn't really want to have anything to do with anybody else. And there weren't really any children for our children to play with. And they rode a bus to the elementary school. So when we visited the Polsons, we fell in love with their house. And it just so happened that the same model was being built on the lot next door to them. So we decided to sell our home and move um, to the house next door to the Polsons. Amber had been born a few months before. She was born in February of 1983. And her name is Amber Catherine, after me, Lewis, and now she's married and her name is Ross. So we moved in, I don't really remember what time of year it was, maybe fall, and our children could walk to school. Carrie Kenton and Amy, I believe, were all in elementary school or getting close to elementary school. So they could walk down the street. It was quite a walk, about three quarters of a mile, but I'd walk that far uphill both ways when I was in elementary school, so that was fine. That's where I was living when I went to the bulk of my nursing school. And the summer before I graduated, the summer of 1987, we decided to put a built-in pool in our backyard. And what we didn't know was that there was lots of rock We had a steep hill in our backyard, and it had been cleared away, but it had been cleared away to the point of solid rock. So we dug down, and in order to get the deep end of our pool, we had to run a jackhammer and jackhammer out of it. So we often said that was our anchor to that house and that we would never leave because we put in so much manual labor putting in that pool. But the kids loved it. And next door, we had a little boy named Clint. And he was an only child, and he was between Amy and Amber. And we kind of adopted him as our own. And he practically lived at our house. And he called Gammy and Granddaddy, Gammy and Granddaddy. And we just had a choice experience growing up with Clint and our four children in that house. We put on several additions. We raised the attic over the garage and put a bedroom for Carrie. We bumped out and put like a glassed in area in the kitchen so that we could see the pool. We put in a pond. We did all kinds of things to that house. And during the time we lived there, John went in and out of construction versus medical sales. And I remember one time we used our house as an open house for all kinds of home improvements that you could have throughout the house. And that was fun. I'd had the surgery, and then I'd gone to nursing school. In the summer of 1986, John and I were doing some kind of remodel something at a house not far from our house. And I started having some stomach pain. Well, it turned out that I had obstructed from my prior surgery, so I had to have surgery again. Thank goodness it was during the summer, so I didn't miss any time from summer from my nursing So when I graduated in 1987, I went to work at Suburban Hospital on their orthopedic trauma floor. They didn't take new grads into their critical care areas, so it was the closest I could get to critical care because I really thought I wanted to be an emergency room nurse. Well, a year later, I had the opportunity to take the critical care course that they offered. It was about a three-month course and you worked part of the time and then you took the course part of the time. But there were no openings in the emergency room, so I applied to and was accepted in their critical care unit. And they had two ICUs, so to speak. One was for hearts and the other one was for everything else. So we got all of the traumas and the medical ICU patients, the surgical ICU patients. We had 12 front beds and six back beds. The back beds were what they called the step down. They didn't do vents back there, but they were people who were a little sicker than out on the floors, and you'd have a three-to-one patient-to-nurse ratio, whereas in the front, we were two-to-one or one-to-one, depending upon the patient. But I learned quickly. 
I worked full-time days, first time I'd ever done that while I was orienting to the unit. And then I immediately went to part-time and they would have you rotate between days and nights. First time I'd ever done nights, but it was 11 to seven. I didn't do 12 hour shifts there. And I managed to make it work. And John traveled a lot, but I could work my schedule around him. And it was handy um, later on when I had more babies because they would sleep at night while I was at work and then I'd be home during the day and he worked out of the home and he'd bring them to me to nurse while I tried to get some sleep. So in 1989, right shortly after I had transferred to the critical care unit, a lot of the nurses were turning up pregnant. And if you were pregnant, you couldn't go down and help when a new trauma came in down in the emergency room. And at this point, I'd kind of given up my idea of being a nurse in the emergency room because one of my friends who worked down there said, Laura, you'll be much happier in critical care because you can kind of run the show. You only call the doctor when you need him. Down here in the emergency room, there's always doctors around and you just kind of do what they tell you to do. So I guess she had me pegged pretty well. So I stayed in the uh, critical care unit until I moved to North Carolina in 1995. So while I was there, all these nurses were getting pregnant, and I kiddingly said to my um, nurse manager, well, I better not drink the water because I'm done having kids. Well, little did I know I was already pregnant. And I was about two and a half months pregnant before I realized that's what it was. I thought my stomach was just being touchy and things, and I'd had uh, some bleeding episodes, and they told me I was premenopausal, so... I just kind of thought that's what was going on. Well, when I finally got smart enough to think maybe I was pregnant, I went and got a home pregnancy test. And back then, they were not like they are now. Suffice it to say, it took over 20 minutes. You had to move the little white stick from test tube to test tube. But I vividly remember it saying, when you put it in the last test tube, you need to leave it for a five full minutes. And if it's white, you're not pregnant. And if it's blue, you're pregnant. But do not read it for five minutes. So I put it in there. As soon as I put it in, it turned bright sky blue. And I thought, oh, well, they want you to leave it for five minutes, so maybe it's going to turn white if you're not pregnant. Well, mine did not turn white. It stayed sky blue. I indeed was pregnant. So it took me a little while to wrap my head around that, but I finally did. And at Christmas, uh, we told the kids she was due in June. I had an amnio in the first part of February, and we could see her moving all around, and everything was fine, and she was a girl. I was 38 at the time, so you know they were concerned about having uh, birth defects and things like that. Well, on Valentine's Day, I was making cookies with the kids. I just kind of had a weird feeling and all, but I dismissed it. And the next day, I had a doctor's appointment, and he was down near where I work. So I stopped on the way home, and I'd kind of noticed that I didn't feel like I was getting any bigger. But, you know, my clothes didn't fit, so I knew I was a little bigger. Well, long story short, they could not find a heartbeat. And he did a sonogram, and the cord was around her neck. And she had probably been gone from shortly after I'd had the amnio three weeks before. So that was very difficult. It was awful telling the kids. They were so excited to have a brother or sister. I went to a Seventh-day Adventist hospital the next day, and I was induced. And she was born, and we got to hold her for a minute. She would fit in the palm of her hand. And we named her Caitlin Elaine Lewis. So by then, we kind of had in our mind that we were supposed to have another child. I got pregnant after about two months, and I miscarried in the summer. We were getting ready to go up to the Hill Kimura pageant, and I had to go and have a DNC the day before and went up there, you know, not having much energy, but it worked out. And then I got pregnant again in the fall, and on Christmas Eve, I had a miscarriage, and I was scheduled to work on Christmas Day, and I felt so bad because I hardly ever work Christmas Day, but there was no way um, that I could work it. So by then, I was kind of like, well, you know, 1990 hasn't treated us very nicely, so, you know, what are we going to do? And I kind of changed my prayer from, please, Heavenly Father, let me get pregnant, to, please, Heavenly Father, let me have a healthy baby. 
Well, during this time, we also asked the kids, you know, they were kind of having a hard time. And we said, well, you know, what would you guys like? Well, my one son wanted a dog. So we got a little corgi dog, named her Cassie, and had her for several years. And then Carrie and I had somehow heard about foreign exchange students. So we had the opportunity to have Nina Kupanaki, I'm probably saying that wrong, from Finland come and live with us for a year. And what a choice experience that was. She was a delightful girl. I still remember her coming home so excited one day. She'd been on the school bus and she came home and she said, Mom, Mom, Mom Lewis, that's what she'd call me. I was dreaming in English instead of Finnish on the way home on the bus. And she was so excited. But her English got really good and we had a, a fun time with her for that year that she lived with us. And it was kind of hard having her go home. Well, shortly after she left, I found out I was pregnant. And McKenna Elaine Lewis was born in April of 1992. And she was eight years younger than her next oldest sibling, which was uh, Amber. Actually, I guess she's nine years, 83 to 92. And so she was a delight in our life. And all of a sudden we had a younger child in the house. Her siblings were all, you know, older. But it was a choice, choice time. Well, we decided that we did not want her to be an only child. So we tried really hard and we managed to have Morgan in February of 1994. We thought he was gonna be our last child, so he has the name of both the missionary who taught us and both of his grandfathers. So his name is Morgan Earl Scott Lewis because we thought we better use any names that we wanted. So we had these two little kids, we were older, um, I kidded John, I said, well, we don't need to have a college fund for these kids, we'll just put it in your retirement account because you'll be ready to retire by the time they're ready to go to school. So we were kind of laid back, I remember being at the park and they'd be running around and they'd fall down and I'd say, get up and brush off and the other mothers would be like, aren't you gonna go check on them and stuff? I'd be like, oh no, they're gonna be fine. So kind of the difference between when you're a mom and you're 40s and you're a mom in your 20s. So in October of 1995, we had our final little unexpected blessing, Hunter. And Hunter's named after my great uncle Hunter, which was one of my dad's uncles. He's Hunter Cameron. And when I found out I was pregnant with him in the spring, John was on a business trip. And I called him and I told him we were going to have a baby in October. And he was turning 50 in September. His birthday was in September and he was gonna turn 50. And I kiddingly said to him, maybe we ought to move to where people retire to because we're only gonna raise kids and then die. Well, before I knew it, we had a trip scheduled to Florida. Well, we stopped in Charlotte where my aunt Amiko and uncle Ted lived on the way down and looked at houses. I'm throwing up and eating saltine crackers because I'm so sick and we are looking at houses. So we actually put a contract in on a house and it wasn't accepted. So a few weeks later, Ken Ritchie, my brother-in-law at the time, and John came back down and looked around and they found a builder they really liked. And we looked at some of his houses and tried to put a contract in on some of them, but that didn't work out. So then we decided we would buy two lots. Well, my parents at the time were serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they decided that if we were both moving to the Charlotte area, it was actually in Cornelius, just north of Charlotte, that they would move down too. So we bought these two lots, and Robin and Craig and my parents had an apartment in their house, and then we lived catty-cornered across the street. So we moved in in 96, so while we were building our home, John and I, and I forget how many kids we had at the time, four, including a newborn baby, lived in a three-bedroom apartment, and John worked out of the apartment. That was like craziness when I look back. So my daughter, Carrie, my oldest daughter, had gotten married the year before, 
So she wasn't with us. And Kenton actually lived in my parents' apartment. So that left us with Amy, Amber, McKenna, Morgan, and newborn Hunter when he was born. And when Hunter was born in October, he had a very low red count for some reason, and he had to be intubated, and he was in the NICU for um, seven days. But then he came home, and he kept his low count, but he did okay. He actually had to have a blood transfusion. Um, but he did fine and, and grew up without any lingering effects of any of that. But that was kind of a scare. So I became a stay-at-home mom with my three younger kids. I did not go back to work in nursing. John was working for Bill Lowe at the time, traveling quite a bit, working in kind of the medical insurance related industry. And we just had a grand time. Robin and Ken lived catty cornered across the street with their three young children. My mom was there. She'd meet him, meet the kids at the bus stop, the ones that went to school, McKenna and Connor and Paul and she'd have gummy bears for him. Robin and I started a business selling felt educational products called The Storyteller and mom would babysit when we went out of town to conventions or various things. We loved using the felt with our kids. So I had my four older kids at this point. Carrie was married. Kenton the next year decided to go on a mission for our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he went to Zimbabwe for two years. Amy graduated from North Mech High School and went on to go to hairstylist school and graduated from that. Then McKenna eventually, four years later, graduated from North Mech, and she went and lived with Carrie for a year went to community college there, and then came back and went to dental hygiene school, and she's a dental hygienist. So my older four, you know, eventually got out on their own. Well, we decided our house was really too big for us, and we wanted to be mortgage-free. So we built a house around the corner. Robin and Ken had decided about the same time to move to Raleigh. So we moved around the corner, built a house there that was a little smaller, and then about a year later, we built a house in our backyard. We had zoning so that we could do that, and it faced another street, and that's where uh, my parents lived for the next uh, 10 years. So they moved in in 1999. We'd moved in in 1998, I believe. So I was the stay-at-home mom until 2002, and our health insurance went up to almost $1,000 a month. And I looked at John and I said, well, one of us needs to go back to work to get benefits. And I was the easiest one, so I interviewed a couple of places and I finally interviewed with Angie Vickers at Carolinas Medical Center, Maine, at the time is what it was called. And she hired me as a weekender. And then I went on to become a full-time person. First time I'd ever worked uh, 12-hour shifts. And she kind of gave me a chance. I'd been out of nursing for almost seven years, but I'd kept my license active. But she believed in me and gave me a chance. And I think I paid her back tenfold. I got very involved. I became a preceptor. I worked a lot with um, our new graduate nurses as they came on board. I eventually was an assistant clinical supervisor to her. I was instrumental in getting shared governance started at Carolinas Medical Center. And just, you know, really took care of my patients and their families. I became progressive care certified, the first one on our unit, and I was the first holistic certified nurse in the system, as well as I became certified in the Gene Watson theory as a Caritas coach. All of this was going on while my younger kids were going to school, growing up, getting bigger, and things. And then when McKenna was in middle school, she had a couple of, no, she was in ninth grade. She had a couple of experiences that made us decide to homeschool McKenna, Morgan, and Hunter. And we did that for a couple of years, and McKenna and Morgan actually graduated from homeschooling. Um, they did not go back to public school. Hunter decided he wanted to do ROTC, so he did go back to public school. And when he graduated, he went into the Army. So he was in the Army for three years, served his country well. Now about this same time, 
my mom in 2009 was diagnosed with lung cancer. And like I said, she and my dad lived in our backyard and we had a pool in between. So the younger kids got their pool because they had been looking at pictures of the older kids when they were little and they saw they had a pony and they wanted me to get them a pony. Then they saw that we had a pool and they wanted us to get them a pool, which we did. We did not relent on the pony. And then while they were all discussing this one day, Morgan said to his two younger siblings, you know, well, the older kids got everything. And McKenna goes, yeah. And then Morgan said, that's not the worst of it. They got mom and dad when they were young. So we got a big chuckle out of that and we'd always kid him. And you know, I tell him, you can't jump on mom's back because I'm kind of old. I was almost 43 uh, when I had Hunter and John was 50. I would kid people when we moved down to North Carolina or shortly thereafter, I'd tell them I have two kids in their 20s, two teenagers, and three in single digits. And that's gone on until today. I have three in their 40s, one in their 30s, and three in their 20s. So they're spread out over almost 21 years. I would not suggest that as a way to go about having kids. Uh, Carrie graduated from high school in 1993, and she went on to marry and have two delightful grandchildren, Sydney and Savannah, and Sydney has recently married Alex. And then Kenton graduated from high school in 1995. He served a two-year mission shortly thereafter, and then he went on and uh, joined the Air Force, and he has made the Air Force th his career and he has a BS degree that he earned while in the Air Force. He's married to Myra Nui, and they have three boys, and we don't get to see them as much as we'd like as he's been stationed all over the world um, with the Air Force. And then Amy graduated from high school in 1997, and as I said, became a hairstylist, and she married Travis, who is a massage therapist, and they have four children, Journey, London, Locke, and Jet, and they own the Pink House Hair Studio and Massage here in Lenore that uh, John and I helped them get started when we had moved to Lenore. And then Amber graduated in 2001, and she is a dental hygienist, and she is married to Matt, and they have two boys, Mac and John Ship Ross, who is named after John, my late husband, and my father, Ralph Ship. Then, they, then we skip down to McKenna, and she finished high school in 2009, and she is married to Blake, and they just had their third daughter. So she has Camille Lara, named middle name after me, and then Molly, Kathleen after her other grandmother, and then Claire McKenna. They just had her um, in January. Morgan graduated in 2011. He's attended BYU and a couple other schools out there and is getting ready to finish up his degree in computers. And he is married to Noel. They've been married a little over three years. Back up to McKenna for a minute. She went to school and became a radiology tech. So she's the person who puts the things behind you when you get an x-ray taken. But right now she's a full-time mom. And then Hunter graduated um, from public school in 2013, and he has finished his time in the Army, and now he is um, looking to become either Secret Service or a Texas Ranger, and he lives in Texas and has two dogs, not married. So now back up to 2010, my mom died in January of 2010, and that was um, a difficult time for not only us children, but for my dad, but he rebounded, and you can hear more about that in his life story. So a year after my mom had died, my dad had been looking for somewhere to invest some money. Amy and Travis had found a piece of property in Lenore, which was about an hour and a half from where we lived, about 45 minutes from where they lived. And it was 13 acres and it had three ponds and it had a house that had had a fire. Well, long story short, they went out and took some pictures, sent them down to us over dial-up internet, which you can imagine how long that took. And John and I decided that it would be a good place for us to retire to. It had been listed on Craigslist, and Amy had found it because it had a chicken coop, and she was looking for chicken coops. 
So we put in a contract on the property, sight unseen, and it turned out that it was owned by a woman who lived not even 10 miles from us and who Carrie had known when she lived in that neighborhood and John had written a website for her husband. So we ended up buying that property and we, uh, in March of 2011, and we renovated the basement so that we could stay there when we were working on the upstairs and then we renovated the upstairs and by about 2012 we had the upstairs livable and john spent most of his time up there i would go back and forth we still own the house in cornelius we didn't sell it until december 2014. once we sold the house there i would stay with mckenna she had bought a house near north lake mall in charlotte so i would stay there and i would do my three days my three 12-hour shifts and then i would come back up to lenore so I finally figured out that I could retire in April of 2015. And I was getting tired of all of the changes that were going on all the time, you know. Every time you went in, they'd have changed another policy or something. And I just really wanted to be able to spend time up in Lenore. Amber and Amy and their families had relocated to Lenore, so we all lived within about 10 minutes of each other. So I retired in April 2015. Uh, they did a nice retirement party for me. My kids, you know, all surprised me with being there. It was a surprise. And afterwards, we went out shopping for McKenna's wedding dress because she was to be married in August. So in August, McKenna and Blake were married, and that was a fun family time. In October, John and I flew out to pick up Morgan, who was on a mission for the church in Las Vegas. So we spent a few days out there with him, and we returned home on our 42nd wedding anniversary, I believe it was, October 27th, 2015. We've been married, yes, 42nd wedding anniversary. So then for in November, we had decided that we would take the grandkids, their parents would have to pay their own way, but we would take the grandkids to Disney World. So we went to Disney World for 10 days over... Uh, in November, and we had a wonderful time. We came home, and it wasn't our year for Christmas. We do the one year Christmas, one year Thanksgiving. So we actually went to Carrie's on Christmas and had a delightful time. Her in-laws, the Thurbers, who we'd known for years, were there. And then we came home, and on Sunday, the 27th of December, we had our family Christmas party. So all of uh, the kids who were in town, lived in town, which was all four of my girls. Morgan was there. I, Hunter couldn't come because he was in the service and Kenton was in Japan at the time. So they didn't come, but the rest of us were all there and we exchanged gifts and things. And I remember John and I commenting what a wonderful night it had been. And John and I watched a Hallmark movie before we went to bed that was about a girl who was in an accident. She was in a coma and came back as an angel. And I don't remember the name of it. But, you know, in the end, the man who loved her ended up calling her back from, you know, being half dead or whatever she was. So, you know, we just had a wonderful weekend. We've been over on Saturday helping um, Amy fence for some horses they were getting. So we just, the weather was beautiful. It was like in the 70s and all. We had a wonderful time. Well, that Monday, I came home from helping my friend Todd, who was a builder, work on his books. And John had suggested that it would be a good project for me because I think he was getting tired of having me around all the time. So I went and worked on his books. And when I came home, I found John lying in the driveway. And I called to Morgan to call the ambulance. And they came and picked him up. Um, he was not at all conscious. He was barely breathing. I kept willing him to keep breathing until the ambulance got there. They took him to Hickory where we joined him. They'd intubated him by then and decided that they needed to transfer him and they were gonna transfer him to Baptist. And I got there just in time to say, please take him to Carolinas Medical Center, Maine. That's where I know people. That's where I used to work. So they had to take him by ambulance because there was too much fog. So they took him down there, and my good friend who I'd called on the way to just say, please pray for me, Jennifer. She came and took me down to Carolina's Medical Main so that, Hunter, so that Morgan could drive home and get things um, for me and bring them down to me. 
So we went down there, and by the time I got there, they'd taken him to surgery, and I spoke to uh, the neurosurgeon and to Dr. Thomason, and they both said when he had come in, they didn't think there was anything they could do for him, but then he'd barely moved his finger. And he was 70 years old, but he'd never been sick a day in his life. He'd never been in the hospital. He took no medications. He had no health issues that we knew of. So they decided to give him a chance, so they did surgery. And I remember when the neurosurgeon met with us afterwards, I asked if we should call his twin brother and others. And he said, you should call anybody who you want to see him. And, you know, I'd been a nurse long enough. I knew code for, you know, this wasn't going to be survivable. So the girls got busy and they contacted the Red Cross who got Hunter home. He got there on Thursday. This was on a Monday, the 28th. And Kenton actually got there, I think, on Wednesday night. Richard, his twin brother, and his wife got there on Tuesday night. So they treated us like royalty at the hospital. And they gave us two waiting rooms. We used one for where we ate. We used one for where we slept. Uh, my sister Robin came over. She and I didn't leave the hospital. The kids would come and go and stay with friends. And McKenna didn't live too far away, so people were staying in her um, home on things. And so we decided that on, Mon on Friday, which was New Year's Day, that we would take him off the vent. And that's what we did. And all of the family that wanted to be there was there. Um, all of his seven children were there. Some of the older grandchildren, John's brother and his wife. And we took him off the vent. And he went to be with Caitlin and his heavenly father. And that was an incredibly difficult thing for me. But I had the farm. We had goats. We had chickens. We had horses. I had a reason to get up every day. I had things to do. I'd had an experience about three months before where I'd been walking back from feeding the chickens. And I'd taken to doing a lot of the um, chores myself. Occasionally, John would come with me. And I saw the light shining on our front door. And it was a red front door. And the thought came into my head, what would you do if something happened to John? And I thought, well, that's a silly thought. What in the world am I thinking of that for? But, you know, I immediately thought, well, you know, you do most of the stuff around here. You know how to do this. You know how to do that. And John had always said to me, why do you ask so many questions? Well, now I know why I asked so many questions, because I needed to know things and all. And so that thought that experience I'd had didn't come back to me right away, but it did come back to me. And I thought, you know, Heavenly Father was preparing me in some way for what he knew was probably coming. I went down. Richard actually fell and had a similar injury to John, although it developed over a longer period of time. And I went down, and I believe it was March or April, and I helped him. And while I was there, I realized that my whole identity was tied up in being John Lewis's widow, and that in fact, I was still Laura Ship Lewis, and I had my own identity. And I started, you know, kind of thinking about what I wanted the rest of my life to look like instead of just waking up every day and wishing I would die so that I could be with him. So I did that throughout the fall. I had people put in my path that helped me. I had a friend, Quentin, who I could go to and complain whenever I wanted. And he wasn't a romantic interest, so I didn't have to worry about you know things I said to him or anything. I rented one of my houses to a guy who was 20 years younger than me, who asked me out on a date. And I thought he was crazy. But you know, I went out with him a couple of times, and I realized that, you know, I could be an interesting person, and, you know, I could have a social life. I wasn't at all looking to get married. Um, I went to a couple of um, single church dances, and I met some people there who became friends who I could visit when I went to Charlotte and could go out to eat with and things and kind of practice my dating skills on. 
the August before, I had made the decision to serve a service mission, is what our church calls it, and you serve it from home. I had signed up to be the nurse for all of the missionaries. At that time, there were 300 of them in the Charlotte, North Carolina mission. And they would call me on the phone, and occasionally I'd go to zone meetings and things and meet them face to face. And when they first came out, I'd go down and I'd meet them in their orientation and explain who I was and what my purpose was and what I needed to do. And I I worked with a wonderful mission president and his wife, President Alexander and Sister Alexander. So I was down there in January meeting with the new missionaries. And we had a friend from Lake Norman War named Josie Mabry, who I had known ever since I'd moved to North Carolina in 1995 from the church. I saw her sitting there, so I walked over and she said, Laura, how are you doing? Because she had known John quite well. And I said, you know, I think I kind of figured this single thing out. I can eat what I want, do what I want, watch what I want on TV. You know, I don't have anybody to answer to. And I've even been on a few dates. And she said, wow, I'm really glad for you. She goes, you should call Bob Kemper. I think he's having a really hard time. And I said to her, I think he's too old for me. And she said, well, I don't think he's that much older than John. I don't think he's older than John was at all. I said, well, you know, I don't want to get married to somebody who's going to leave me a widow again. And she kind of laughed. So I drove home, and it was about an hour and a half home. And all the way home, I just have this little voice saying to me, send Bob Kemper a message. Send Bob Kemper a message. And he had come to John's visitation, and I had gone to his wife's funeral because Amy had been quite close to his son, Ben, in high school. So we'd gone down and gone to, his fu to her funeral, and I'd seen him there, and I told him, I'm sorry you've joined the Widow Club. I did message him. And he told the story, mostly accurate, <laughs> on his story. But suffice it to say that by, I believe it was Valentine's Day, which... Our first face-to-face -face meeting was January 30th. I believe by Valentine's Day, we knew we were gonna get married and we were officially engaged shortly thereafter. And we did get married in May and I've had a delightful life. It wasn't the life I pictured myself having back when I was in my 30s or 40s or even my 50s, but it is a delightful life. And I am so blessed that I have had two strong, faithful men who love me and care for me in my lifetime, and I couldn't ask for more. So stay tuned. Eventually, we will do a video on our many travels. We've bought a uh, motorhome, and we have plans to travel. My dad always encouraged us to travel, and he lived with us the last year and few months of his life, and uh, last summer, we finally said, okay, Dad, we're going to do what you've been wanting us to do. So uh, we're excited to, to travel and see the U.S. And, and continue to live life and love life and watch uh, the grandkids grow up. So thanks for listening.